Hey everyone, my name is FlygonHG, and this is the video of my attempts to Nuzlocke Pokemon Fire Red using hard Nuzlocke rules. Now before I begin, you're probably asking a lot of questions. What's a Nuzlocke? What are hard Nuzlocke rules? Why am I watching this? If you aren't asking those questions, go ahead and skip to the rules of the challenge section. But for those of you who are healthy enough to have never tried a Pokemon Nuzlocke, let me explain. A Pokemon Nuzlocke is a playthrough of a Pokemon game where the player plays by a set of rules to make the game harder. This is because Pokemon games, in general, are stupidly easy. So sadistic adults like myself make the game harder for themselves so that they can relive the nostalgia of their youth. Now, there's a lot of variants of Nuzlocke run-throughs, but the most basic Nuzlocke rule set comprises of three rules. One, if a Pokemon ever faints in battle, it is considered dead. You must immediately release it or permabox it for the rest of your playthrough. This is the main source of difficulty. If your starter gets knocked out by a trainer's Pokemon, you can't rush him over to your local free healthcare clinic and heal him up. He's dead. Gone. Rest in peace. This makes it significantly harder to beat even common enemies, but it also makes it far more important to consider gameplay mechanics that you would never think of, so it makes the game fun. 2. You can only catch one Pokemon from each route of the game, and it must be the very first Pokemon you find. If you knock out the first Pokemon you find, too bad, you can't catch another one on that route. This also makes the game a bit harder, because it not only limits the overall number of Pokemon that you can catch, but it also makes you use Pokemon that you might never have used in a regular playthrough. I have fond memories of strolling up to the Elite Four in a Pokemon Fire Red playthrough with a Beedrill, because that's what I got in Viridian Forest instead of a Pikachu or a Pidgey. Forcing certain Pokemon on the player requires better strategies and more fun, at least theoretically. And three, you must nickname all your Pokemon. That way, when you watch the light leave the eyes of your sweet little warriors, it hurts even more, knowing that no one, no one will replace the bond that you had with your precious Pokemon. Okay, so those are the basic rules of nuzlocking. Sound fun? Well it is, but after you've done a few nuzlocks with basic rules, you get numb. If you play enough of them, you learn that nuzlocks can be almost as easy as a regular playthrough just by overleveling your Pokemon, or using items. So you can make your nuzlocke playthroughs even harder by adding an additional hard rule set. And these rules are based off of a Nuzlocker on YouTube called Pokemon Challenges, who does Nuzlocks for a living. Dream job. He's the best out there, so check out his channel if you haven't already. But basically, the additional hard Nuzlocke rule set imposes three additional rules. One, items cannot be used in battle. No potions, no X items. Held items, though, are allowed. Two, you cannot level any of the Pokemon you use past the next gym leader's highest leveled Pokemon. If a Pokemon exceeds that level accidentally, it must be boxed until the next gym badge is obtained. And in 3, battle mode must be on set for the whole run, meaning you do not get free switches following the defeat of an enemy Pokemon. All of these rules make the run significantly harder, which makes it more fun. Alright, so now you're caught up, and with that, let's see how I beat Pokemon Fire Red using hard Nuzlocke rules. I start my journey by picking Bulbasaur as my starter. Bulbasaur is probably the best starter early game, because he's super effective to the first two gym leaders. He's also a chonky boy and takes hits well late game. I named my Bulbasaur Boobisaur. Boobisaur and I are immediately challenged by my rival Butts and his new Charmander. And this battle goes pretty much as expected. I mean, as an experienced Pokemon trainer, we cr- I start my journey by picking Bulbasaur as my starter. Bulbasaur is probably the best starter early game, because he's super effective to the first two gym leaders. He's also a chonky boy and takes hits well late game. I name him Bob and decimate my rival Butts 2 and his new Charmander. First try. After getting Pokeballs, I catch my first set of encounters. From Route 1, I catch a Rattata and name her Anyone Can Cook, because anyone can cook, and that's an important lesson to remember. From Route 2, I catch a Pidgey and name it Pudge. On Route 22, I catch a Mankey and name it Hugh Mankey. And in Viridian Forest, I catch a Caterpie and name it Doggerpie. I'm hilarious. Before the first gym, I train up Bob, Pudge, and anyone can cook, but Bob clean sweeps Brock without even breaking a sweat. After that, we get a ton more encounters on our way to Cerulean City. But before that, we have this insanely close call where I almost lose Pudge to a Rat Poison Sting Ekans. I was incredibly lucky, and it was a huge mistake on my part. But we survive and move on. From Route 3, I catch a Spearow and name it Spear Column. I go ahead and box Spear Column. In Mount Moon, I catch a Zubat and name it Patient Zero. On the other side of Mount Moon on Route 4, I catch an Ekans and name it Snake. Unfortunately, Snake has the ability Shed Skin instead of Intimidate, which is one of the best abilities in the game. So I box him. We have a fight with Butts 2 up next. At this point, I don't have much for Charmander, but after some training, Pudge evolved into Pidgeotto, 
Bob evolved into Ivysaur, and anyone can cook evolved into Eradicate, so I'm confident going in. Pudge goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Butt 2's Pidgeotto. I bring Bob out for his Rattata and do some damage before he switches out to his Charmander. I switch in Anyone Can Cook, Tail Whip him once to guarantee a Hyper Fang kill without triggering Blaze, and then go for the kill. Abra comes out next, so I switch to Bob and suck him dry with Leech Seed to get full health. Last is Rattata, who goes down to a Vine Whip. And that's Butts 2. From here, we get a couple more encounters. North of Cerulean City, on Route 24, I catch an Oddish and name him Weirdo. And on Route 25, I catch a Waddell and name it Peewee. Trash encounters into the box they both go. After some training, it's time to take on Misty. She's a bit scarier than Brock. Starmie is actually kind of threatening. Or so I thought. Anyone can cook, one-shot Staryu, and then takes a chunk out of Starmie. I'm dead to a crit here, so I switch to Bob to be safe and Vine Whip Starmie for the W. Two badges down. On my way to Vermilion, I catch a Meowth on Route 5 and I name her Cat. Her pickup ability is relatively useful, so I keep her around for cut and free items. I also drop Patient Zero off at the daycare. I'm sure nothing bad will come from that. In Vermilion City, I get an Old Rod and immediately fish up a Magikarp named Fish and box him. Gyarados is disgusting and would actually be a great addition to the team, but let's make this a bit more challenging. You can actually get a lot of really good guaranteed encounters in this game. Snorlax, Lapras, any of the Evolutions, and Gyarados. They're all really, really good, and they actually make a Nuzlocke challenge pretty easy, so I'll be skipping them. But if you're doing your first Nuzlocke, those are great encounters to help you out. Anywho, on Route 11, I catch my first actual party member in quite some time, a Drowsy. Psychic types are really good to have. I name him... Jeffrey. In Diglett Cave, I catch, you guessed it, a Diglett. I name him Nougat, and Nougat will be key for Lieutenant Surge. But before I do that, I need to take on Butts 2 on the boat. It goes basically the same as the last battle, except this time, it's on a boat. Pudge goes wing to wing with Pidgeotto. I sand attack Raticate before switching to Bob and taking it out. Kadabra comes out, but Jeffrey walls him pretty well and takes him out with a few headbutts. And last is Charmeleon, who gets put to sleep by Jeffrey and killed by Nougat. Afterward, I rub an old man's back and then head off to Lieutenant Surge's Electric-type gym. The plan is to just dig through his whole team with Nougat. Voltorb and Pikachu are both one-shots. I didn't think that Dig would one-shot Raichu, so to avoid multiple double teams going up, I just magnitude twice for the W. Easy. Now it's time to make my way through Rock Tunnel. I decide to go get the HM for Flash, even though I can probably just feel my way through Rock Tunnel without it. Turns out, that would have been the better decision, because on our way back from getting Flash, I accidentally run into one of the scariest things you can see at this point in a Nuzlocke, a level 29 Dugtrio. Not only is a level 29 Dugtrio much stronger than all of my Pokemon, it also has the ability Arena Trap, which prevents all grounded Pokemon from fleeing. This is really, really bad. I have Jeffrey out who will surely die before he can take out Dugtrio. I was doomed to lose Jeffrey. Or so I thought. See, Dugtrio can actually have two abilities, Arena Trap and Sand Veil. And luckily, this level 29 monster had Sand Veil. So before Jeffrey got hacked to pieces, I was able to switch to Pudge and hit him with a few sand attacks to make my escape. And somehow I made it without any deaths. That was incredibly close. I could have easily lost a handful of Pokemon if I was just a bit more unlucky. But after that near encounter with death, I head to Celadon City and the 4th gym, getting a handful of encounters along the way. On Route 10, I catch a Voltorb and name it Bokey Paul. In Rock Tunnel, I catch a Geodude and name him Geoguy. And on Route 8, I catch a Growlithe and name him Bjork. Bjork has Intimidate, which means that Bjork is going to be a beast if I can keep him alive until he becomes an Arcanine. I could evolve him as soon as I get to Celadon City by buying a Firestone, but then he'd miss out on some important level up moves. So for now, we keep him as a Growlithe, but he joins the team. After some light training where Nougat evolves into Dugtrio and Jeffrey evolves into Hypno, it's time to take on Erica. But given that we have a Fire type, a Flying type, and a Psychic type, I'm really not too worried about Erica's Grass Poison Pokemon. I start with Growlithe to lower Victory Bell's attack and then take him out with two Embers. Tangela comes out and goes down into Embers as well. Vileplume attempts a Stun Spore, but I have a Cherry Berry to thwart it, and after a second Stun Spore, Bjork finally takes some damage, but by then, it's too late. Erica's plants have been burned to the ground, and I get my fourth Gym Badge. I really didn't think that it would be that easy, but I did get some lucky misses there. After the fourth Gym, the game becomes somewhat non-linear, and the map opens up quite a bit. 
My level cap jumps from 29 all the way to level 43, because both Koga and Sabrina have one Pokemon at level 43. So the plan is to get all the encounters and fight all the trainers all around the map and then take on Koga and Sabrina back to back before anyone goes over the level cap. I start by catching a Doduo on Route 16 and naming him, them, Bill and Ted. In Celadon City, I get the gift Eevee and name it Eevee, but I put it in the box as well. After doing the game corner and the whole Team Rocket thing, I go to Lavender Town and complete that whole quick side story where I save an old man or whatever. Nothing exciting here, except I do catch a Ghastly and name her Ballo Gas. In Fuchsia City, I get a Good Rod and fish for a Golding and name her Claire Coy after having to Google how to spell Koi. I then move along the east coast of Kanto and catch a horsey named Kawa, a crabby named STD, and a venonat named Peapod. They all go in the box. I also circle back to Route 6 to fish up a Poliwhirl and name him Swarly, and I do the fighting dojo in Saffron City where I'm gifted a Hitmonchan that I named Jackie. They all go into the box as well. However, I do get one more encounter by fishing for a Psyduck in Viridian City. I name her Chicken, because I think that's funny, and she joins the team, replacing anyone can cook, who retires to the box for a long life of cooking and watching TikToks. With that, I have a full team of six that I'm pretty happy with. In certain Nuzlocke runs, I'll actually rotate Pokemon in my team based on the upcoming gym, but this game is actually pretty easy, so for grinding purposes, it's just easier to have a solid six and keep it the same. Speaking of grinding, it's time for a crap load of it. At some point during this grind, I come to the realization that Pudge is weak as all hell. He has a timid nature, which means his physical normal and flying attacks are weakened. And on top of that, Pidgeotto and Pidgeot are just naturally pretty weak. They don't even learn Drill Peck. I mean, just look at how little damage he does to this Farfetch'd. So, Pudge gets the hard boot and I train up Bill and Ted to replace him. Unlike Pudge, Bill and Ted have an adamant nature, so they get plus attack. And on top of that, Dodrio has significantly more natural attack. In this grinding session, Bob evolves into Wenyasaur, I give Bjork a Firestone and he evolves into an Arcanine, and Chicken evolves into a Golduck. And Bill and Ted evolve into Dodrio. Once everyone hits level 40, I decide that it's time to take on my rival in Sylphco. This rival fight is considered one of the harder ones in the game. His starter is level 40, so he can actually do quite a bit of damage, but I need to beat him to unlock Sabrina's gym before I hit my level cap, so it's now or never. And here, tragedy strikes. Twofold. Unfortunately, I forgot to hit record during this session, so I don't have the footage of our epic battle against Butts 2. Which is a terrible moment to forget to record, because we experienced this run's very first death. In a battle that goes relatively smoothly until the very end, Charizard hits Bill and Ted with a blaze-boosted flamethrower, knocking him out from full health. Bill and Ted's tenure was short, but it will not be forgotten. At this point, I need to replace Bill and Ted. I could bring back Pudge, but Pudge sucks. He's just so bad. So instead, I decide to train up Spee Column as my new flyer. He's basically a slightly weaker Dodrio. Spee Column evolves into Firo after another grinding session. Fun fact, there's a trainer on the bike route, Cubal Isaiah, who has a Machop and a Machamp. By using the Versus Seeker, you can fight this guy over and over again, and each battle he gives you a ton of experience points and also gives you 4 attack EVs, making it a great place to train up physical flying types. Anyways, after this grind sesh, it's time to take on Koga and Sabrina. We start with Koga. My main thing I'm concerned about is his wheezing using self-destruct. I start with Bob to take out his first coughing with strength. Muck comes out and I just whittle him down with Leech Seed as he uses Minimize strats. The second coughing comes out and I set up with Leech Seed to put him to sleep to get a free switch into Jeffrey. I take out coughing and out comes wheezing. I'm a bit worried that he'll self-destruct here, but it turns out that one Psychic is enough to knock him out, and that's badge number 5. At this point, my Pokemon are starting to get very close to the level cap, so I head right over to Sabrina's Psychic type gym. I don't have any Pokemon that are super effective to her Psychic types other than Bite from Bjork, so I'll just have to overpower her. Unfortunately, Alakazam is incredibly strong and incredibly fast, so this could easily be the hardest battle of the run. I start with Bjork against her Kadabra, who one-shots it with a bite. Mr. Mime comes out, so I switch into Spee Column. On the switch, Mr. Mime Calm Minds, which is actually really bad. I forgot that Sabrina likes to use Calm Mind, but fortunately, Mr. Mime goes down to a single drill peck. Pudge couldn't even dream of that. Next is Venomoth, who is obviously one-shot with a Drill Peck. Last is the terrifying Alakazam. 
Remember literally 10 seconds ago when I was reminded of Sabrina's Calm Mind strats? Well, I didn't learn my lesson, because I switched to Jeffrey and Sabrina uses Calm Mind. This is actually pretty bad. I decide to go for a Hypnosis here, which misses, and Sabrina uses Calm Mind again. Her base 135 Special Attack Alakazam is now at plus 2 Special Attack and plus 2 Special Defense. This is really not good. She goes for another Calm Mind, as I risk it with another Hypnosis. Thankfully, this Hypnosis lands, so I switch to Bjork as Sabrina uses a full heal. Thinking that I will outspeed it, I decide to go for a one-shot with Bite. This is stupid for two reasons. One, Alakazam is base 120 speed and a level higher than my base 95 speed Arcanine, so it's really unlikely I'm going to outspeed this. And two, Bite is a special move in this game, meaning that I was trying to one-shot Alakazam at plus three special defense. Alakazam is frail, but it's not that frail. So this is, by all accounts, an idiot move, but somehow I'm not punished for it. Bjork hangs on with 1 HP and then counters with pitiful damage from Bite. This is insanely lucky, I can't believe he survived this. But still, things are looking really bad here. I decide to switch to Jeffrey, who loses almost half his health from Psychic. My only play is to go for a blind hypnosis, switch, and then hit Alakazam with a physical attack before it wakes up. Fortunately, Psychic doesn't crit here and hypnosis hits. So after that, I switch to Speed Column and Alakazam stays asleep. On the next turn, somehow, Speed Column outspeeds Alakazam and Drill Peck gets the knockout. That means that if I had just used Drill Peck as soon as Alakazam came in, I would have been completely fine. I can't believe how lucky I got. Bjork is a beast for tanking a plus three Psychic from a freaking Alakazam. Such a good boy. So by the skin of my teeth, I get badge six as well as the TM for Calm Mind. Two can play at that game, Sabrina. With Koga and Sabrina defeated, I now have access to Surf which gives me access to a handful of new encounters. I whiff on catching a Tangela on Route 21. On Route 20, I catch a Tentacool and name him Squilliam. In the Seafoam Islands, I catch a Dugong and name her Amy Dunn. And in the Pokemon Mansion, I catch a Goopy Grimer and name her Gwyneth P. I also revive an Old Amber on Cinnabar Island to get an Aerodactyl, who I name Pateri. After getting the key to the gym from Cinnabar Mansion, which, by the way, is ridiculous, it's Blaine's job to be a gym leader, but anyways, finally it's now time to take on Blaine. Now, if you've never played Fire Red, you might not know that Blaine is the hardest gym leader in Kanto. He can devastate teams if you aren't fully prepared for everything that he throws at you. Fortunately, I have an elaborate strategy to beat him. I think it's just best to watch it play out in action. After my to-the-wire battle with Blaine, my cosplayer friend Bill asks me to come to the Sevi Islands with him. I go because I need to train my Pokemon before the 8th gym anyway, but it's pretty uneventful. I catch a Machop named Manchop and a Ponyta named Kauta on Island 1, but all other possible encounters are repeats so I can't catch them according to the Species Clause. While I'm on one island, I also decide to kill the Fire Chicken hanging out on Mount Ember because I can. Anyways, after saving a little girl from a Hypno, Jesus Christ, Nintendo, I come back to Kanto to take on the 8th gym leader in Viridian City. As the last gym leader of Kanto, Giovanni can be one of the most difficult trainers in the game, but it's nothing some clever gameplay can't handle. Let's take a look. With that, it's time to take on the Pokemon League. But before getting to Victory Road, we have another battle with Butts 2. The last time we met, he murdered Bill and Ted, so I do have to be careful here. After getting everyone to level 50 and learning some new moves via TMs, I confronted Butts 2. We start with Nougat who hits Pidgeot with a Rock Slide. A Feather Dance means I don't two-shot the Pidgeot, but I do get a nice flinch. A third Rock Slide takes out Pidgeot. Execute comes out and goes down to a Drill Peck from Spicolum. Next is Rhyhorn who falls to the Blaine Giovanni strat from Chicken. Then Gyarados comes out, and he can actually be kinda scary, but Bob stalls him to death with Leech Seed, Sleep Powder, and Razor Leaf. I time it to get a relatively free switch into Chicken to set him up for the Charizard waiting in the back. Surf does decent damage to Charizard, but now Blaze is active, so I switch to Bjork. Even resisting it, he takes a good chunk from a Flamethrower. 
but Extreme Speed takes care of Charizard. And lastly, a Flamethrower plus Extreme Speed takes out Alakazam before it can get off a Calm Mind boosted attack. Butts 2 is done, and now all that's left is the Elite Four and the Champion. The level cap for the Elite Four is a bit tough to pin down, because the later trainers have stronger Pokemon than the first few. I decide on level 60 for a level cap to match Lance's Dragonite. The Champion, spoiler alert, it's Butts 2, will have higher leveled Pokemon, but will match everyone in the Elite Four. That seems fair. So after several hours of grinding and spending all my money on coins for items, TMs, and vitamins, I face the final challenge, the Indigo Plateau. Lorelei the Ice Trainer is up first. I start with Bob against her Dugon and set up a Leech Seed. Retrospectively, this was really dumb, because I was dead to an Ice Beam critical hit. I also got frozen, but that doesn't actually matter because my plan from here is to switch to Jeffrey and set him up. Remember the fight against Sabrina? It's time for a Calm Mind Sweep. On the switch in, Hypno gets hit by an Ice Beam and she gets another freeze. Two freezes in a row has a 1% chance of occurring. But fortunately, I immediately dethaw and start setting up Calm Minds as leftovers and Leech Seed damage keeps me healthy. At this point, it's pretty much over. At plus 6 special attack and plus 6 special defense, the only thing that Lorelei could possibly do is crit and freeze me with a blizzard. After Dugon goes down, Lapras comes out and then goes down to one Psychic. Same goes for Cloyster. Slowbro actually takes a Psychic, but does pitiful damage in return. Even with a crit, we'd be fine. I decide to switch to Shadow Ball to save some PP on Psychic, and Shadow Ball is a two-hit kill. Just as a reminder, in this game, Shadow Ball is physical, so my stats aren't actually buffed. Last is Jinx, who surprisingly goes down to a single unboosted Shadow Ball. Nice. Next is Bruno, so I heal up my boys and go to the next room. Bruno leads with an Onyx, so I lead with Bob, who one-shots it with Razor Leaf. Onyx looks so cool but it is one of the worst Pokemon in the game. It levels up ridiculously slow, it has terrible special defense, and alarmingly low attack. It's so bad. But anyways, Hitmonchan is next, so I put it to sleep and switch to Spicolum. Unfortunately, Hitmonchan wakes up and hits me with a Rock Tomb, which is super effective and lowers my speed. With the speed drop, I'm likely slower, and I don't want to risk a crit, so I switch to Jeffrey. I go for the Psychic as he misses a Sky Uppercut. Anticipating a heal, I Calm Mind once. The next turn, I get hit by a Sky Uppercut as I go for another Calm Mind, planning on one-shotting the Machamp in the back. After another Sky Uppercut, Psychic takes out Hitmonchan. Hitmonlee is next and hits a nasty Mega Kick before going down to Psychic. Bruno's second Onyx comes out and hits a critical hit Earthquake to take me down to 43 HP as I kill it with Psychic. Even after Leftover's recovery, I'm way too low to stay in here. Hypno is pretty important for Agatha, so I can't risk him going down to a crit. I decide to switch in Bjork for an attack drop. Machamp misses a cross chop and then uses scary face as I switch into Bob. Machamp then uses bulk up, which could be pretty scary, but I hit a leech seed and put him to sleep after some negligible damage from a cross chop. From here, Bob takes him out with a few razor leaves. See ya, Bruno. Third is Agatha, who would be an absolute cakewalk with nougat if it wasn't for the fact that three of her five poison type Pokemon are immune to ground type moves. But even so, she shouldn't be too much trouble. I start with Spicolum, who is immune to ghost-type attacks from Gengar. I also give Spicolum a Lumberry in case she tries any hypnosis shenanigans on me. Two Drill Pecks take out the first Gengar as she just tries to double-team. Golbat comes out, so I decide to just hit her with Return. It's enough for a two-shot after some damage from Air Cutter. Arbok comes in with Intimidate, so I switch to Nougat, who frankly has been largely useless since he's swept the third gym. Dugtrio is just a little too weak and a little too frail to be that good in Nuzlocks. Watch him almost die to a critical hit, but not very effective, Sludge Bomb right here. The bastard gets poisoned, too. I decide to wager that a super effective Earthquake is enough to kill Arbok, and it is, leaving Nougat with just 8 health. He lives to fight another day. Haunter comes in, so I switch in Spicolum, knowing that a Drill Pick will one-shot the Haunter. All that's left is Agatha's second, stronger Gengar. It's possible that this thing has Thunderbolt or something, I don't actually know, but I decide to stay in with Spicolum, who actually hits a critical drill pack for a one-shot. Replacing Pudge was the best decision of this entire run. We're down to the fourth and final Elite Four member, Lance and his dragons. This is kinda scary, but Chicken has Ice Beam, so I'm not super worried. After healing everyone up, I put Bob in the front and move to the next room. Lance leads Gyarados, not a dragon by the way. I do the same thing I do with every single Gyarados. I Leech Seed, Sleep Powder, and Razor Leaf it down. I switch to Chicken while Gyarados is still asleep, and Lance uses a full restore as I hit it with Ice Beam. I decide to play it safe and switch back to Bob. 
And it's a good thing I do, because Gyarados hits a nasty Hyper Beam. On the recharge, I put it back to sleep and then switch out to Chicken. Chicken gets in for free and kills Gyarados with an Ice Beam on the next turn. Dragonair comes out and I hit it with an Ice Beam, which leaves it with just a sliver of health. Crap. Dragonair then hits a Thunder Wave. This is actually kind of bad. I probably should have given Chicken a Cherry Berry. Thankfully, Dragonair misses a Hyper Beam the next turn and then goes down to a second Ice Beam. Lance's second Dragonair comes out, so I switch to Bob. Dragonair sets up a Safeguard, which is actually kind of inconvenient because I could have used Sleep Powder, but I decide to Brute Force this one and hit it with Strength as he does decent damage with Dragon Rage. A second Strength leaves it with a Sliver as I lose more HP from another Dragon Rage. I take it down with a third Strength and Aerodactyl comes in. Also, not a Dragon. Anticipating Wing Attack, I switch in Bjork to lower his attack. Then, anticipating Rock Slide, I switch in Nougat. I'm almost right. Aerodactyl uses Ancient Power and thankfully does not get the boost. So I hit it with a Rock Slide from Nougat, but Aerodactyl outspeeds me and hits a pretty hard Wing Attack. The second Rock Slide will kill Aerodactyl, but a critical hit Wing Attack will kill Nougat. I decide to risk it. As I said before, Nougat hasn't been that useful and I don't really need him for Dragonite or the Champion. Unfortunately, Aerodactyl uses Hyper Beam instead of Wing Attack, which kills Nougat. RIP, buddy. But every cloud has a silver lining. Thanks to Hyper Beam, I can switch in Chicken and get off a Surf for free on the recharge. I mean, unless I get paralyzed. Shit. Fortunately, Aerodactyl uses a very weak Ancient Power and goes down the next turn. Now all that's left is Lance's level 60 Dragonite. He's scary, but we have Ice Beam. He outspeeds me thanks to Paralysis and hits a disgusting Outrage. A crit might have killed me. My Ice Beam connects, but it leaves him in the red. I really can't sack Chicken because I need him against my rival's Charizard. I'm pretty confident that Jeffrey can handle Outrage even with a crit, and I'm right. So I outspeed him and hit him with a Psychic for the- Dragonite survives with one health. Come on, man. This means Lance is most definitely using a full restore. So I prepare for that with a Calm Mind. This is a bit risky because it leaves me dead to crit, but I don't really know what my other play is. The full restore comes out as I set up Calm Mind. I decide to do another Calm Mind, hoping that it would make Psychic a two-hit kill. Dragonite wastes a turn using Safeguard, so two Psychics are enough to take him out and win the battle. My final challenge is taking on the Champion. One more battle with Butts 2. I heal everyone except Nougat, RIP, replenish some PP, and get ready for the final battle of the run. Spia Column faces his most poetic opponent yet, a Pidgeot, the teammate he replaced, and to be frank, he absolutely destroys him. Two returns, even after a Feather Dance, demolish the Garbage Bird. Rhydon comes out and I switch to Bob. Bob gets hit with Scary Face and a pretty terrifying Earthquake, but takes out Rhydon with a Razor Leaf. Alakazam comes out, so I switch to Jeffrey. Since our last confrontation with Alakazam, Jeffrey has learned Shadow Ball, which absolutely destroys Alakazam, but I decide to take this opportunity to set up some Calm Minds. Alakazam really isn't doing much to me here with Psychic and Future Sight. After setting up a bit, a single Shadow Ball takes out Alakazam. Next is Gyarados. I decide to go for one Psychic, which just barely takes out half of Gyarados' health. A second Psychic knocks out Gyarados, and Butts 2's terrifying level 63 Charizard comes out. He does dirty damage with Aerial Ace as I hit a Psychic for about half health. A Citrus Berry means that I likely won't KO with another Psychic, and an Aerial Ace crit would kill me, but I decide to risk it. It's the last fight after all. Aerial Ace comes out, doesn't crit, and Psychic just barely manages to take out the Charizard. Last is Exeggutor. So I switch in Bjork, who after a few turns of sleep, one-shots the tree with a flamethrower, winning us the battle and the run. Well, that was a ton of fun. Fire Red is incredibly easy, even if you avoid the really strong guaranteed encounters like Lapras and Snorlax. Many of the gym leaders are easy sweeps if you have one Pokemon with the right type, and any Psychic type with Calm Mind can devastate most of the Elite Four. Actually, if you're in Leaf Green, Slowbro can almost single-handedly sweep the entire Elite Four with Calm Mind, Psychic, Surf, and Ice Beam. But regardless, I had a lot of fun with this. This is the first Nuzlocke that I fully recorded and made into a video. So if you enjoyed watching this, please like the video, subscribe, or comment down below, all the YouTube stuff. I'm hoping to do more of these videos for other Nuzlocke challenges, and as we go on, I'm hoping to try some even harder challenges like Nuzlocke's and ROM hacks. So until then, I'm FlygonHG, and thanks for watching.